What up, Z-Pack? <laughs> Here they come. It's uh, your boy, Z-Dog MD, and your girl, Dr. Kate Martin. And you are the residency director, School of Medicine, UNLV. Yes, I am. And the only doctor who will tolerate me to join her on rounds. That is not true. The only one. None of them will because they're like, oh, he's going to flap his gums. He's way too bald and his head's too shiny. Because look at this. Look at this. You think that's normal? No other attending has that. Anyway, z -Pack, check it out. I'm super excited today because we are rounding at UMC Hospital and we just finished our rounds. Heard about a really, really, really interesting patient that I can't tell you about because there's this thing called HIPAA. HIPAA. And I have all the residents here and the residency director. And I thought these guys were there on the morning, 5 a.m. on the morning of the shooting at UMC. And they are gonna talk about what it was like here, especially you know, as family medicine residents, like what do you do for a gunshot wound? How do you help without being in the way when the trauma surgeons are running around? And was it chaos or was it weirdly quiet? These are the things that I think as healthcare professionals, when we extrapolate what would happen in our institution in a mass casualty event, these guys can help us. Should we show them the team? Absolutely. All right, people. First of all, these guys have the dopest team room in the history of team rooms. They just got it. Let me just show you this. Look, they have a full kitchen in their team room. Who has that? No potluck, no food. They're all starving. That doesn't matter. They have the facilities. And then over here, we have two young medical students. And go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Amanda. Amanda, fourth year? Fourth year medical student. And? Johnson, I'm a third year. Awesome. And uh, y'all are going to be um, seen but not heard because you're medical students and we don't care about you. <laughs> now we're going to turn around over here. Exactly true. Welcome to the hierarchy, snitches. Here is the team. Uh, and we're going to go through... Uh, we got everybody in? Yeah. yeah right Let's do some quick introductions, z -Pack. What do you think? Um, I'm Kathy. Third year family medicine resident. Third year fam medicine? Kevin, second year family medicine resident. Awesome, and you guys got to speak up because the microphone oh, is, oh. yeah, 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 and uh, over here? Justin, first year medical resident. Intern. 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 None of this first year. Oh, no, yeah. you're an intern, right. and never forget it, <laughs> my friend. Hi, I'm Viet. I'm also an intern. Yeah, all right. So we got the turns, we got the second year, the third year, and two attendings, and a couple of medical students, and this is the team I'm rounding with today, and I'm super honored that they would let me anywhere near either them or their patients given that the judge's restraining order has not expired. So that being said, y'all uh, were all there. You were the team on, on the morning of Monday. Mm -hmm. And okay, what would the dude, you're an intern. Sure. You just came out of medical school. You were in Alabama, right? I was in Alabama. In right. Alabama, where there are minimal shootings, mostly uh, uh, intentional. Yeah, handgun right? related, I'm sure. Exactly. And what, so what was it like walking in and, and seeing this thing happen? What was the mood in here? What was going on? Well, I think the interesting part of it was the night before. So I, I was on Sunday afternoon, and we had been rounding on our normal patients, and I was about to go to sleep, and then I got a message from a friend that said, hey, there's an active shooter on Las Vegas. Are you there? Are you okay? And I just assumed it was the same thing, someone with a handgun. Right. And then you look up the videos on Twitter, and it's like, a, like automatic gunfire. So I'm about to go to sleep, but I have no idea how this works in terms of mass casualty. Does everyone get called on board? I half expected my pager possibly to go off and me just, if I was available, to come to the hospital. So the next morning was, I knew we're the, the trauma center. They're going to close down everything except for gunshot wounds and um, likely life-threatening events. Uh -huh. So I just got, got dressed pretty quickly and made it to the hospital as soon as I could. Because I just imagined it would be more like organized chaos to a certain extent just like a lot of people a lot of orders being shouted and you're just making yourself useful when you can and you get there and it's actually very very quiet like wow. all the entrances are blocked off by police because they're just, just trying to make sure that no one floods the hospital just necessary personnel only how did you get in did you have to show your badge just showing the badge yeah, yeah, yeah. and so then that was it so we walked inside and it was pretty much empty like all the hallways were kind of empty i expected like a lot of stretchers or other things to be there given the number of people injured, and that wasn't the case at all. You walked into the ER, and we just did our normal routine. We waited for our pages for admissions. And so yeah. they were gunshot wounds, of course. But that was yeah. it. It's still kind of a very normal day. Wow, so do you think that's a testament to how they train and their process here? Maybe, I'm not 100% sure, because that's also many hours after the event. I think the shooting started around 10 o'clock right. the night before. So they had kind of cleaned up the right. triage, yeah. Definitely, because we can't. We come in at uh, 5 in the morning. So right, and no one had paged you saying come in. 
Because no. no one had paged me either. And I think they would have paged me to said, please don't come in and get in the way. Because you're a hospitalist and there's not a lot you're going to do for this acute yeah. gunshot wound right away. Right. Did you guys feel like you wanted to do more in that situation? Or was it just a, uh, you know, it's like being at a code where you're kind of in the way? Or did, it, did you feel like you could contribute there? I, personally, I felt uh, when we got the admits, I think we were fine with helping when we could. Yeah. I think the other part is also like, it's outside of our scope of practice to say, yeah. like, I'm not, we're not going to be digging bullets out of anybody. If anything, we'll just be holding a tourniquet for someone else. Yeah. And so the idea of they stabilize patients and they admin into our services so that our eyes could watch them in case they destabilize or something. Yeah. So the trauma surgeons can go to the ones that are more urgent. And I think that made sense for all of us. We didn't feel useless in that capacity at all. So did you have a lot of admissions that day then? Uh, we maxed out our yeah. admissions. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and the caps and everything still apply. Yes. Yeah, yeah. oh, nice. I'm glad to hear that because it was going to get real otherwise because, you know, then ACGME comes in and starts yelling. <laughs> I don't care if it's a mass casualty, right? Right. right. And were you there as well? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I were both there. Um, yeah. It was what? interesting. Um, so, like, a lot of my – I grew up in Vegas for the yeah. most part, and uh, I have a lot of family friends and stuff that work in the casinos. And, uh, it was pretty eerie because, I mean, the Strip is where a lot of my uh, – family friends tend to work and uh so the first thing when i got the news around like 3 30 ish i think is when we got the text that there was like i was i was sleeping when this happened and then yeah i got a text that there was like a shooter in mandalay bay and i had like a whole bunch of things running through my head because uh, i have a lot of family friends that, and like some family that actually work night shifts or on this trip so yeah. that was like the first thing i did was contact me. call everybody yeah. yeah um so that was a little i was a little shaking like in terms of uh Kind of how I was feeling that morning, and then when you had to drive into work, I had no idea what to expect. Yeah. So um, I don't know. It was just uh, it was it was pretty surreal. And when I was driving, I didn't drive on the freeways because uh, it was blocked off from that area. Right. So I was just driving local, and it was completely empty. And I had the radio on, and I think the the, the death toll at that time when I was driving was around thirty. And yeah. Then I, and then up. as I was driving, actually, it went up a little by little. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because they had like live broadcasters on at that time. Yeah. So that was a little, that was very surreal. But when I got to UMC, I was expecting, well, I mean, I went to medical school over uh, through Unsum and I've been rotating through UMC. So um, I kind of expected the trauma team there to really have everything sorted out and triaged and mm. they did a really good job of doing that. And mm. I think they've always been prepared to handle something like this. Um, but it was just surreal. Like I witnessed it firsthand. Everything was very eerily quiet. And we're just waiting for our admits, which, yeah. you know, happened well, to be. You know why I know you're an intern? Because look where your pager is, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, I know. I know that he puts it there because he keeps it on vibrate because he's a smart intern. And in order to wake him up, it needs to be right here because it's like getting a sternal rub. <laughs> and it's bringing me right back to that time. Now, there are a lot of people in the comments who are saying that there's a problem with the Facebook feed, even though we have 500 people live watching right now. And that, this is a stupid Facebook app. So for some reason, for a lot of people, it's showing as, well, video will start soon. Just log out, log back in. Of course, you can't hear me say that because you can't see the video. But for everyone who does see it, um, please, please check it out. I don't understand what's going on with Facebook, but we will try to fix it uh, for future casts. In any event, so y'all, now y'all are more the seniors. Um, what were your thoughts on the whole thing? And if you want to just hold this, my brother. Sure thing, yeah. Yeah, and just talk right into the camera, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, like, you know, I didn't know about anything that went on until, like, the morning of. Mm -hmm. And so it was a bit, it was, like, for me, like, waking up, it was chaotic. I was getting text messages from family, friends, and all that. And I didn't really know what to expect coming into uh, UMC also. But, like, you know, like, um, like Justin and, um, and Viet said, like, it was surprisingly very, um, it was, I thought it was organized, you know. Like, it, it was, like, eerie. And, you know, it was, you know, the functioning was, uh, the, the hospital was just, you know, functioning surprisingly well despite all the chaos that ensued yeah. and all that so but yeah like like they pretty much touched on i mean we, we capped out on our admissions and um mm -hmm. uh, i tried to you know help them with uh, they they did a fabulous job of kind of you know taking care of everything and all that so mm -hmm. but um can, can i ask you a question sure. yeah so um <clears throat> you're a second year resident yeah. just pretty much entering second year for a couple months right in mm -hmm. july or so yeah was that a harder transition than being an intern? Um, yeah, absolutely. Being like, it's kind of a, it's a different role being a senior and all that, you know. It's, yeah. Uh, trying to just run everything and getting, you know, no, just 
just basically kind of directing the show is a totally different experience. And, um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm used to just sort of as an intern kind of taking orders and all that. So yeah. Looking for guidance. So it was, a, it's, it, it was definitely a bit of a transition. For do, me. do you let the nurses help you out? Uh, when, when they can, sure. Yeah, because <laughs> that's the way to survive, let me tell you. You know, when it, my biggest transition was from intern to second year, I made a lot of mistakes. I was learning to be a leader, learning to teach. Man, that was the hardest time and the most stressful. And I think I made one or two medical errors that hurt people in that time because I didn't supervise enough and I, I gave too much latitude and I, I wasn't, you know, detail oriented enough. And so I learned that, you know, I'm a sort of 30,000 foot guy, but when it comes to supervising and teaching, you need to dig into the weeds. You need to be uh, detail oriented. I'm always yelling at Tom and Logan because there's little details that are missed, right? And they're like, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, no, it does matter. Because you gotta understand, people die in medicine when you miss the details. And that, that was one thing that I learned in that transition. Um, what's it like being a third year and leading a team? It's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's really easy if you have a good team following you. So it's more of just directing and making sure that the team stays organized and that everyone knows their duties. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for my medical students, you think you're off the hook. You're never off the hook. <laughs> this is Z Dog Industries here. We put everyone on the hook. That's our, that's our motto. I'm going to slide over here. So you, darling, are doing a sub-internship in family yeah. medicine. Are you insane? Why would anyone be a family practice doc in this day and age? What? What kind of question is that? It's, it's an honest question, <laughs> and you're going to give practice. me an honest answer. I, I like primary care. I like being there for the big changes, the small changes, the day-to-day -day stuff. Getting, like you said, getting into the details, taking care of the little things that people aren't going to necessarily see in the hospital. I love it. Are you worried about working in a 2.0 grind where you're seeing 40 patients a day and click, 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 click? Or do you think it's going to change? I don't know. I, I think it's going to be a lot of differences pretty quick. It's going to, it seems like it'll be changing a lot very quickly. So. Are you going to be part of the change? I hope so. Awesome. The future is bright, my friends. And you know, Dr. Martin is an inspiring family medicine doc because not only does she see patients in the clinic, not only does she care deeply about the underserved, she is also a teacher and a mentor and a leader, and that's why I am honored to be able to round with her. Um, and look, now she's all embarrassed, which is what I do. <laughs> um, let's read a few comments and see if y'all wanna weigh in. So because primary care is amazing, says Alyssa Lavoie, especially when you work at a community health center. So that's definitely, and you guys take care of people who have no other recourse. Hope you address the Dr. Glenner statement soon. What a quack, Marisol Shelton. Have you guys heard about this? So it's a doc who talked a bunch of smack about nurse practitioners, said they have low IQs, and when stuff hits the fan, you need a doctor and so on. And look, at, I didn't want to dignify that statement by sharing it. Everybody keeps sending it to me. I'm like, yeah, why are you giving this guy publicity? If you believe in team-based care where everyone practices at the top of their education level, why would you share a crappy comment by a 1.0 doctor? Anyways, we'll do a show on it because we have to because everyone's asking us to. But you know, look, you guys are family medicine docs. You work with nurses, you work with nurse practitioners. We're part of a team, right? I mean, would you wanna just be a solo person and you against the Never. world? It doesn't make sense. And would you wanna be a jerk to people who are trying their best to take care of patients? You might, because I can tell you. But no, I'm kidding. But yeah, no, you're not, you're not going to. Now, um, let's read some more comments. Um, Vegas has a lot of rich and poor, says Cynthia Ijogu. That is very absolutely true. True. Yeah, very true. And every now and again, you guys will take care of tourists and stuff, right? people passing through and it's always a different experience than the homeless guy with DTs or something like that. And do you guys see a lot of substance abuse here? Oh yeah. <laughs> unison response, mental illness all the time. And our resources are strained, right? Yeah. So when we're thinking about disposition and where how is this patient going to get help? It can be that the struggle can be so real, right? So we need to do better, Zpac. Let's read some more comments. You need to listen, okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's keep reading and find a good one. Sometimes I read, start reading a comment and I'm like, that's not a comment I'm gonna read. Um, I work at a trauma center in St. Louis, Missouri. I can only hope that we handle the situation as awesome as you did. Great job, Abby uh, Sternow-Dingwell. Oh, that's nice of you, Abby. You know what, but you, we had help, right, uh, Dr. Kate? They, Absolutely. The Pulse um, doctor. That's right. Came and trained us a few yeah. months before this. That's right. 
was well timed. Well timed to say the least. Yeah. And they were so generous uh, with their time and 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 knowledge because then we're in a better position to handle a similar event. Yeah. So we all help each other, you know, yes. like and you know these guys. We were talking earlier about the powerlessness that you can sometimes feel when you want. It isn't your specialty to remove bullets. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I felt it that day. So I went and did a show and I tried to raise money and I did what I could, but I still felt pretty helpless. And I remember a lot of people in the comments were yelling at me like, why aren't you in the hospital seeing patients? Um, have you ever been that guy at the code who doesn't know what he's doing with running a code but is up in there trying to help? And you're just like, can you get out of the way so that the people who know what they're doing can help? So sometimes you have to accept that, you know, and th this comes up, you're on an airplane. And they call for a doctor. What do you do, right? And then that's your chance to use your training. If you're a nurse, it's your chance to use your training to help other people. And you will get called on. There's plenty of chances in this in this life to help people. And you will find your space. So don't feel guilty if you can't be there. And there's a lot of uh, undercurrent of uh, feeling powerlessness. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Bup, 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 bup. We need more primary care physicians in the communities outside of the hospitals. Good luck to you all, Rachel Hignite. Yes, yes, and, and we we are we're in the hospital and and the community and and agreed and that's that's where a lot of our work is done is preventing people from getting into the hospital if if we can. So. Yep, yep, and you know, look, guys, four percent of our healthcare dollars on these guys, primary care and prevention. 96% of our healthcare dollars on the failure, on, on this hospital, the failure of primary care and prevention, right? Now, we may have a Hotel Paris clock, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that was bought from Savers as a used thing and stuck up here. So we need to fund primary care and prevention. We need to make primary care, family medicine in particular, sexy as hell so that everybody wants to do it. And I'll tell you, like, rounding with these cats like this cat over here okay my boy <laughs> he presented a super complicated case this morning and look interns presentations uh, you, uh, here's a little bit for the medical students and interns okay interns presentations are often absolute crap and the reason is that they don't understand what's important they don't understand yet how to organize their thinking without l reading off a note they don't um, they don't communicate at a speed that attending physicians actually process data because they're still learning. Sorry, I'm eclipsing, eclipsing. There we go, there we go. And so as a result, when you see it done correctly, and this is how he presented this morning, okay? He had his note here, but he was like this. Okay, so, you know, Dr. Demania is new to the team. I'm gonna fill him in on all the backstory, even though everyone else here already knows, but he did it in a concise way. He says, this is the story of this person who did this and that, and this was the thing, and then this happened. Now, this is why this happened, and this happened. We did these studies, this is what we found on physical, and this is what the labs were showing, and these were the medications. Now, here's what I think is happening, and here's my plan. And I was like, wow, because it's unusual to get that concise and complete of, a, of an understanding, which what it tells me as an attending physician is he knows his patient, he understands the physiology and the pathophysiology, and he's come up to a, to a conclusion and a plan. Now, Dr. Kate and I may quibble with little details of the plan, and that's our job. If we don't do that, then we're useless. So we may say, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Do you, have you thought about this? That's how you learn. So this is why I love rounding with these guys because I get to be a part of that again. And I miss it because when I did it at Stanford, it was so part of the fabric. You know what You know what caused me to quit, really? So the reason I started making, I, I left and moved to Vegas, I took that job when Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos said, hey, quit your job and come build a clinic in Vegas. I was like, they had pulled away my house staff at Stanford. They said, you know what, with the new work hour rules, you're a community hospitalist with an with a, um, adjunct faculty appointment you could just do it all yourself and we'll support you, we'll educate the nurses that you're not an intern and they shouldn't yell at you all the time and so on and so forth. And so I did that for about a year and a half and I realized the whole purpose of my life, I'm expendable, I'm, I'm a commodity now. Any hospitalist can step in and do what I'm doing. But no hospitalist could have the relationship and the mentoring and the patient care the way that I did it in my mind. That was my unique gift and it was taken away by corporate but buttheads and I said no nope, no nope, not gonna do it this is not my calling anymore this is not my path I missed y'all right and so now to, to be able to do this on you know uh, 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 
few days a month means so much to me, right? And I know you guys hate it because you have to listen to me flap my gums. And they're like, can we go finish rounds? I'm like, no, we're going to do a live cast. But it, this is why we do what we do because we find our calling and we chase it and we don't compromise. And so I want to thank Dr. Kate. Thank you. I, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to to have you on our rounds. You bring something special to rounds, Dr. Demania, and I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> We're not gonna define special, <laughs> but I know what she's saying. And I wanna thank y'all for doing everything that you do to help patients every day, for being an awesome team, and for tolerating me. And I wanna thank the real future here. <laughs> These two characters who are off in the kids' corner, they're at the kids' table, <laughs> drinking out of a sippy cup. That's <laughs> not, not our cup. That's oh, that's intern sippy cup. We don't get a sippy cup. You don't get a sippy cup, that's true, that's true. No, the interns have learned to just take the tube feeds. They just go straight, they go straight for the hyper owl. And thank you for joining us. Thanks for lending all your all's wisdom. And ZPAC, I love y'all. Tune in tonight. We're gonna have Dr. Scott Schur, the head of emergency department at Sunrise Hospital, the other uh, institution in Vegas that took even more patients because people drove them there in their private vehicles because Sunrise was so close to the shooting. We're gonna have him on to talk what was the impact in the emergency department. He's an emergency physician. And I love y'all. We out. Peace. Share this. Hit like. Tell the world. Respect family medicine.